welcome to Sina Monica. So, it's my favorite time of the year because we get to talk about all of the great movies that we watched throughout the year. And for some reason, 2023 was like going all out with movies. I want to start this video though with a disclaimer because these are based solely on how much I like them personally. I'm not judging these movies by a technical standpoint. This is a completely subjective list and you may have a different list and that's okay. Opinions. They're so great. Having said that, I'm gonna tell you my top 10 and then special mentions that didn't make it into the top 10, but they're still great movies. Let's take a moment to stretch before we start. Okay, I print mini versions of the movies. I just love having miniatures. Maybe I'll make them into little like d mini DVDs. I don't know. Coming up at number 10 is Barbie. <laughs> I have seen a lot of hate towards Barbie lately. I feel it's because it's been like six months since it came out. I feel like that's when people start turning on movies. I'm gonna stick to my feelings when I watch the movie in theaters. Honestly, I just had a lot of fun. It's one of the times I had the most fun in theaters this year. I feel like the movie was a lot more than what everyone was expecting it to be. Obviously, a movie that could have only been made by Greta Gerwig. She just put so much humanity into her films. Obviously, it was a tough job to humanize Barbie. Barbie, this perfect being. I think that she really succeeded and she made such a fun movie. I don't think it's a perfect movie. I think there's some jokes here and there that didn't quite land on me, but if there's someone out there saying that they did not have fun watching this movie, they're lying. Margot Robbie was obviously just perfect in this role. And I know a lot of people talk about Ryan Gosling, but I feel like he really deserves to be talked about because this was not an easy role. I don't think he's associated so much with comedic roles, but he is incredible at them. If it was any other actor, I don't think it would have been as charming and funny. Obviously, the production design is something that I'm still in awe of. I mean, the dream houses, the sequence where they go from the Barbie land to the real world, it just gives you this sense of fantasy. I feel like this movie really took that child's imagination and put it on the screen. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. I think this movie flew under everyone's radar and that's a damn shame. It's one of the most wholesome coming of age movies that I have seen lately. And this year alone, I didn't really see many coming of age films, I guess. When I was like 13, this movie would have been an obsession of mine. It is so charming. I feel like this film had so much heart. It was just such an honest portrayal of a 13 year old girl. And I absolutely loved it. This movie is just incredibly sweet. And if you haven't watched it yet, I really recommend it, especially during this like holiday family season. Um, it's a perfect movie to watch with your family. And yeah, it's just so sweet. I loved it so much. The Boy and the Heron. I'm not gonna talk about this movie too much just because I already made an entire video just about this movie. So if you haven't watched my full review of The Boy and the Heron, you should go watch it after you watch this video. Basically, I love this movie so much. I think Hayao Miyazaki, he can't really make a bad movie. His filmography, it's just top notch, incredible, 10 out of 10. This one was just the perfect final film, even though it's not really gonna be his final film but it's about legacy. It's about moving on after major loss. It's about accepting change. I love Miyazaki movies in general, but I especially love Miyazaki when he's exploring these fantasy worlds, you know, Spirited Away, House Moving Castle. And I think this fits perfectly into that. It's, it reminded me a lot of Spirited Away. It's an incredibly beautiful film. I still haven't seen the English dub though, and I really want to, especially because of Robert Pattinson want to see my full review check out my video number seven Oppenheimer 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 we heard this name a lot this year Barbie Oppenheimer Barbie Oppenheimer I don't think this phenomenon could be recreated again even if studios will try trust me they will try I have never felt such anxiety watching a movie Oppenheimer was the good kind of anxiety because that whole scene you know which scene it's one of the most insane movie experiences I've ever had. I w it was a miracle I didn't go to the bathroom in those three hours, but I just couldn't stand up from my seat. I didn't want to miss anything. <laughs> and yeah, it was just masterful. I mean, such great storytelling and just filmmaking in general, and the performances was were great as well. Just the fact that I really want to watch a three-hour movie about a physicist, again, in a bomb, that just says a lot. I don't want to pit Oppenheimer against Barbie because I never thought it was a competition. It was always a partnership, but 
I did like both of them pretty much the same, but I do think Oppenheimer is the better movie in general. There you go. Number seven. Number six, Poor Things. A one of a kind movie experience, in my opinion. I have never seen anything like this movie ever in my life. I actually really like Yorgos Lanthimos movies. I think they're just perfectly weird. They say so much about humans, even though it's more of like a really perverse and strange take on humans. It's about this woman who, um, well, she got... <laughs> It's about this woman who basically has a baby's brain. So we see Emma Stone as Bella Baxter go from ages like zero to, I don't know, 30, adult. Her performance is just, it must be so hard to get into the mind of a character like this. This whole movie kind of looks like a cheesecake factory and I think that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I really love the production design and the cinematography. A performance that really took me by surprise was Mark Ruffalo. He was extremely funny. He was like an asshole, but he was so charismatic. The whole movie is really, really funny while also being very messed up. I just really liked it and I loved seeing the character development of Bella. Beautiful to look at, beautiful story, beautiful performances, beautiful directing beautiful everything number five Astrid City you know I am ride or die for Wes Anderson I will defend his honor till the day I die I think his movies are most of them are incredibly sad but they're also incredibly human yes his movies are beautiful and he probably spends a lot of time for them to look that beautiful you know he also spends a lot of time with his characters and especially with Asteroid City I found it to be one of the most heartbreaking movies from Wes Anderson. The way that it deals with grief was so beautiful. The beauty of Wes Anderson movies is that they're not only really sad, but they're also really funny. And of course they're beautiful to look at. It's just, just a perfect blend of everything. And he just really did an incredible job with it. It just has so much heart. Sincerely, I think it's one of his best movies. Who was it that made, was it Variety? That made a list of the worst movies of 2023 and Asteroid City was in it? Let's move on before this gets heated. Number four, The Holdovers. This film brought me so much joy in a way that no other movie has done this year. Genuine, heartwarming joy that I haven't felt with a movie like that. In a while it's about this professor who is pretty much a loner he has no friends no family nothing and he doesn't have the greatest personality either like everyone just hates him it's just an unhappy person he is tasked with taking care of the students that are left behind during christmas break so the entire movie is about this student the teacher and the lunch lady kind of bonding you know getting to know each other on a deeper level i think something that really makes this movie stand out is that they don't make movies like this anymore there was a time where these types of movies were really common and maybe this movie wouldn't have stood out as much I don't know 30 years ago, but right now I don't see many just heartwarming uplif Uplifting movies like this. It just makes you feel so good when you watch it It's the perfect movie to watch with your family again during the holidays. Also the look of it. It just looks like a 90s film or, or, or maybe 70s film. It, it just has this nostalgic feel to it. Like when you watch it, you feel like maybe you've watched it before. It's just very nostalgic. This is why I put it at number four. It's just one of the best experiences I've had watching a movie this year. Paul Giamatti, wow. What a performance. This man needs, needs to be nominated. After I finished it, I had to watch Big Fat Liar because that's, I feel like that's when I first watched him uh, when I was little. Yeah, he's always been great. Number three. Anatomy of a Fall. It is a French movie. Well, it's half in French, half in English. It's about a woman who is accused of her husband's death. So she goes through this trial. She's the primary suspect. They had a kid together. He is partially blind because of an accident that happened a long time ago. While the trial goes on, you get to discover little by little what their relationship was like. And it was just so intense and deeply personal. It has I kid you not, probably the best performances I have seen in the entire year. I seriously have not seen a better performance from an actress this year. She was incredible. The little kid, that kid can act. And the dog, the dog can act. There's a dog in this movie that can actually act and he 
Like he also deserves the Oscar for best animal actor. I love how ambiguous this film is. It was just so tense and that tension never seemed to be released at all. I think the, the way that it was set up was also really genius. A lot of it was the trial, a lot of it was their home life, a lot of it was past recordings and past memories. And it was just genius. Honestly, incredible filmmaking. All right, number two. Number two might be controversial. <laughs> My number two is Priscilla. I think it might be controversial just because it's probably not on a lot of people's top five of the year. But me, I, ow, being a Sofia Coppola fan, I've got the Bible here. Clearly, I love this movie. I'm not a Sofia Coppola defender as much as I am a Wes Anderson defender, I guess. Because there are some movies of hers that I'm not a, really a fan of, to be honest. I don't think they were good at all, some of them, on the rocks. But, like, I can't say the same for Priscilla. I feel like Priscilla was the most Sofia Coppola Sofia has ever coppola in a lot of years. She really went back to sad, lonely girl, period piece that she was known for. And what I personally loved about Priscilla is that it felt like this really fragmented dream. It wasn't technically a story that went from beginning to end. It was more of these little pockets of memories that were very dreamy, very hazy. Obviously, from the very beginning, you can see that she was so lonely, so isolated. How her life revolved around Elvis. She couldn't really be her own person up until the end. Yes, she had everything, but also, you know, at what cost? I think Sofia Coppola really treated Priscilla's story with a lot of care and tenderness and you could really feel that in the filmmaking as well. It really feels like a centerpiece for her filmography, in my opinion. My favorite movie of hers is Marie Antoinette. I don't know if Priscilla might top it. I don't know, I have to rewatch Priscilla, I've only seen it once. Of course, the production design, dreamy, beautiful, delicate, coquette if you will. Perfect. I just love Sofia's style so, so much. I need her to keep making films about sad, lonely, rich women because that's what she excels at. And I'm not gonna ask for anything else from her. Keep doing you, Sofia. I will be there. Number one spot, number one spot. Number one movie, Past Lives. Past Lives. What a perfect little film. This movie is about a woman who moved at a young age from Korea to, I believe, Canada and then she ended up in New York City. Went to college, had her life, got married. But ever since she was young, she had this friend crush in Korea. They kind of met at some points in her life, you know. When they were kids, they met. While she was in college, they reconnected through Skype, through messages, and then as adults is when they finally saw each other again. Obviously, there was always tension, but the timing was never correct. When they see each other again, there's a lot of these questions that resurface, you know, this connection that they obviously have that they can't really act on anymore. She's married, they both have lives. He lives in Korea still, she lives in New York. I think it's such a relatable movie because I feel like everyone, everyone in this world has had moments of, oh, what if I did things differently? What if I lived somewhere else? And everyone has people that sometimes they wonder what if things have worked out. I just think the way that this film deals with that, I mean, it's the whole premise, was so beautiful, absolutely beautiful. It's such a simple movie, but it is one of the most powerful movies I have seen this year. It's gonna become my new <laughs> before sunrise. It just really puts a lot of things into perspective and it makes you think about all of those decisions that you've made in your life. I could really feel for these characters. They're not real. I could really feel for them. Even her husband. I like that they didn't make him, they didn't actually make him a bad guy, you know? He's the one that ended up with the girl, right? So in most movies, in most rom-coms, he would be seen as the bad guy because everyone's rooting for the main, you know, characters to get together. The, the way that this character was written was so genius because you could really feel for him too. It's just heartbreaking and there's a part of the film where they're laying in bed together and he, oh my God, I'm, <laughs> I feel like I'm going on a tangent. I don't wanna um, spoil this if you guys haven't seen it. I just wanna say he had so many great lines that were really heartbreaking. They all did. Oh my God, I'm gonna cry again talking about it. Truly such a human film. 
the most beautiful movie I've seen in 2023. It also has these comedic moments, a story about two people. Sometimes that's all you need to make a film. I mean, in my list, there may be movies where I'm like, I don't know if I should put this at number six. I don't know if I should put this at number two. Like they can be changed around a little bit, I feel like. But this one, this is my number one and it will, it cannot be changed. This movie truly has my heart, love it. I hope it wins awards, and even if it doesn't, it won the award of my heart. Those were my top 10 movies. I, sh I guess I should have started with the special mentions. <laughs> Why didn't I do that? Some of the special mentions that I want to talk about, they didn't necessarily make it to my top 10, but they were in the top 15, I guess. Um, and they are passages. It's basically this really funny and messy situation where this guy has a husband, but he's also kind of dating this girl. He cannot contain himself and he's just messy. And I loved it. I love seeing this like love triangle story. It's a French movie. Um, the fashion in it is great. It's very entertaining, really funny, love. Okay, this might be controversial. Stop burn. I wasn't a huge fan of the story. The only reason why I'm putting it on my special mentions is because I truly think it's absolutely gorgeous to look at. I think Emerald Fennel has a really good eye and talent for visual storytelling. I think the writing itself, the characters, they weren't as fleshed out as I would have liked. So that's why I I'm, I'm kind of like 50-50 on this film. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I had so much fun watching it. I think it's one of the best animated films of the year, obviously. I especially loved Wen's storyline and her world. It just looked so beautiful, like, like watercolors. Killers of the Flower Moon. A lot of people will have this movie in their top five. I agree that it's an incredible movie. It's great. The story, um, the performances, especially Lily Gladstone, but it was too long. Three hours and 30 minutes. It lost me quite a few times. So I think if it wasn't that long, if the story was condensed a little bit more, I would have liked it more. I would have enjoyed it more, but I didn't enjoy my viewing experience as much because of it. It's a great film and I know it's gonna win like most of the awards. I know it. Those were all of my special mentions and my top 10. There are a couple of movies that I haven't seen that I'm dying to see that I don't know if they would have made it into this list. Some of them are The Iron Claw. I need to see Zac Efron in this film. I had posters of that man in my room when I was 12. I really want to watch Monster. American Fiction, haven't seen that. The Zone of Interest. Fallen Leaves, I haven't seen Napoleon. Dream Scenario, Eileen. Yeah, I still have to watch all of those movies. I don't know if any of them would make it into my top 10, but if they do, please let me know what are your favorite movies of 2023. If there's one movie that I recommend from my entire list, it is Past Lives. Please go watch Past Lives if you still haven't. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys on the next one.